Hi, everybody. Welcome again. My name is Scott Hunter. I'm the writer and director of Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. Today, I am with one of my partners in the show and an executive producer, Paul Capsar, just to find out more about what people think of the finished product now that it's done. And we've seen it. Most of you have it. Um, so welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Scott. I'm glad to be here. So let's start with first. Tell me what you thought about the film now that you've seen everything. It is a very interesting film. I I can't say I enjoyed it, <laughs> but it was very, uh, what do I want to say? It's very enlightening as to what, you, know, you certainly wouldn't think that it would be um, that difficult to be that when you're that successful and to find the challenges that your family had to overcome. In some ways, they did really well, and in other ways, it kind of fell apart later. Yep. Well, since a lot of people don't know what we're talking about, let me show everybody the trailer, which at least that we can show you, and then we'll talk further. Here, take a look. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans Furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They live the American dream, and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. They, they created something out of whole cloth, and he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. Okay, so there's a little bit about what the film looks like. Uh, as Paul said, I don't know if exciting is the right word, but you know, for me, I think you'll see a lot of yourselves and your own family members and whatnot in it. But tell me about uh, some of your favorite parts of the film. Well, it was very interesting watching the rise of, of how they did things and the, the, the high points of it with the, going all over the world being the best, best furrier in the whole world at the time. That's very impressive. Uh, and just looking at the families, looking at the people, uh, it was very interesting to watch. Tell me, um, when you first got involved in this, why why this piqued your interest and why you ended up, why you're sitting here today? Well, why don't we actually flip this around and talk about you and why you got into this and what this means to you? Okay. We could do that. That's what... That's what you said. So let's begin with an easy one. What do you think of the film? Uh, well, I, I happen to agree with you. I don't know if exciting is the word, I, and, and I agree. I think enlightening is really the word. And that that's what it was for me more than anything, was um, enlightening because, you know, I knew a lot of the um, outer layers of the onion of the story. 
But by getting all these people together, and there's 20 some odd different people really piecing this together for us, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and seeing all these other perspectives, I got out of my own space, my own headspace, my own tunnel vision, and really got to look at uh, what's going on with the entire picture. And so in some ways it was therapeutic because it helped me relook at and reflect on some of the things uh, maybe that I've held on to for way too long, <laughs> decades. Um, and, and in other cases, like I said, it was just enlightening to, to get the full picture and to see that there were other people involved in a lot of these similar situations, both familial and professional, and uh, how everything affected them. So what are your favorite aspects of this film? Well, uh, you know, there's, there are my favorite aspects um, thematically, you know, and then there are my favorite aspects story-wise. So thematically, I, I love the music. I think the score by Vince Loria in every scene sets the tone magnificently. He and I did one of these also, and, you know, and he spoke about how his, he got more and more familiar with the project, how he went back and rescored a lot of the stuff and remastered a lot of the things. And so the music's brilliant. And then, um, you know, Michael Eidlis, who did the narration, he is a, he and I are friends since he was eight and I was 10 or 11 or something like that. And, um, you know, and, and so it was great to have him come along because I was so intimately involved in being one of the interviewees, I, I could narrate it as well. So it was great having him. If you knew the tale from the beginning, you might question as to why this happened, how this happened. But when you stitch it all together, when you strip away the well-earned gloss, the fame and the fortune, what you find are broken people, broken business models, and a broken history. So broken that it resulted in multiple tragedies. And as far as the things that I love most, uh, you know, like I said, I love finding out more things about my family that I assumed I knew and found out that I kind of knew. Okay. And now I feel like in, in most cases, if I don't fully know, I know a lot better. So, so that was really exciting. Uh, and, then, and then there are a few uh, areas in, in the film and stories where uh, things happen that I didn't know about, like um, my aforementioned best friend of life, Michael Eidlis tells a story about my wedding with my grandfather I had no idea about. In fact, here, I'll show it to you. It's 1989, and I'm a groomsman in Scott Hunter's wedding in San Francisco. So I said to myself, self, let me go downstairs and get myself a manicure and, you know, be all fancy for my brother's wedding. So I go in, I sit down, and who walks in? Harold Sussman himself. And I'm like, oh, this is heavy, man. Me and Harold getting a manicure together. I love it. I do agree with the score. It is really fascinating because I've seen this in the development. The score does really add a nice piece. And Michael as narrator is perfect. Yeah, you know, in fact, in the music, if I went back and pulled up some of the earlier versions with you, like I said, we really changed. Uh, the, it became much more orchestral mm -hmm. as time went on and a little bit less, a lot less, I guess, and Vince, I think, would agree, a lot less guitar picky. Right. Uh, and it was just, again, as he got more attuned to what the mood of the project was, everything reflected that. that came yeah. Out. yeah, it really it really enhances the film. So this is some family you come from. Tell us about Thelma. Uh, well, Thelma, like all of them, uh, my, Thelma's my grandmother. She was the oldest daughter of Rose and Julius, of, of the six siblings they had. Um, again, this is a story about abandonment and depression and tragedy that's worse than depression. I'll let with, again, without having seen it, let you all make your own conclusions from there. Um, but it's a story about <clears throat> these six kids that were abandoned pretty much by their parents when they got here to America. 
and were forced to fend for themselves. With Mother Rose in bed to stay, Thelma was sent to Mrs. Pope's finishing school in Philadelphia and returned as a housekeeping force to be reckoned with. Unfortunately, that was all she was taught, and as with her siblings, parenting her own child would prove challenging as none of the Meltzer children learned coping skills. And they all responded to that in different ways from, uh, I guess, as one of the psychologists who analyzes each section of the film says, from mania, you know, of one of the brothers starting this empire that, that as you said earlier, became the largest of its kind in, in an industry, um, to another one becoming one of the top legal scholars and um, uh, professors in the country. And, you know, well, he helped write the UN Charter and the Nuremberg Attorney and everything like that. Right. These are overachievers in their response to others who the depression was so severe that their response was to curl up into the ball further and further and further. Um, and, and in some cases surviving it and in others, you know, not so much so. You can probably pull that unless you've got a weak link and it'll snap when you put a load on that chain. So think of all those generations, you know, the, the brothers, the aunts, the uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, each of them a link. Some people are more vulnerable. They can endure a lot more. But if you've got somebody for whatever reason, then um, we've talked about what some of those reasons would be, but the weak link is that's where the, the load on that chain will snap. And, and so, you know, again, poor parenting, you know, for, to these six kids, and they were all poor parents, you know, and so so that's what was modeled for them. You see it in the film, you hear it from their children and grandchildren and, and the great-grandchildren of all these people, and, and that all got passed down. And I think just maybe now in this generation, which would be the third generation, you know, and the, the great-grandchildren of Rose and Julius Meltzer, some of us, not all of us, but some of us are figuring it out. So you see that you know, some of the offspring of this third generation and the fourth generation may uh, have a better chance of, uh, uh, of surviving this melody that, that really going back to my great grandparents now has, has lasted for multiple generations. And I'm sure if you studied it, it goes way back before them too, because, you know, multi generational tyranny, you know, what I've learned is can go back dozens of generations. Right. right. Yeah. And the, the phrase that comes to mind is the old one the sins of the father. And it really has nothing to do with moral sins or anything like that. It's the things that happened to the prior generations cascade down and impact the follow-on generations. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the th things that, that that that's in the story that people will see in themselves and their own families, regardless of where they come from or their ethnicities or their uh, uh, financial or social circumstances. But one of the things that you'll see is. Um, loyalty and togetherness and one for all and all for one is a very difficult thing to hold on to. <laughs> and uh, in the case of my family, it dilutes as the generations go on. And right. so one of the struggles and challenges along with this depression that's dripping down from my great grandparents is staying together as this empire is built. And, and quite frankly, some, some serious wealth was built. Then the same thing with the family business without giving away anything for part two and three. Tell me more about that. Uh, everything that's in the film is true and how it happened. And, um, you know, one of my cousins put it uh, pretty succinctly in the film, and it and, and it's, was widely known that, you know, the people in my family running the company treated their employees like they were family, and they treated family like the employees or less than employees, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, and that is true, and you see that, uh, that resonate all throughout the film. You know, one of the things that, Again, when you step back uh, and come out of the lens of this now, ha having seen the uh, opinions and recollections and reflections and reminiscence of 20-some-odd people, uh, you see that um, the people who worked in the company, until things got really bad and there was some real you know, trauma put onto people, but they loved it there. Evans was famous for it. I mean, they gave everybody an opportunity to, you know, to excel. Evans, they wanted everybody to be book smart, but you got to be street smart. You know, you can you can be a genius, but still be an idiot. They loved working there. They loved being there. They loved my family. They loved uh, my uh, my my cousin David, who ran the business, and his father before him, and and 
and and even David Sun, uh, my cousin Robert, who ran it at the end. Um, on the other side of things, the family members, myself included, all have very different recollections that aren't nearly as positive, you know, because the five to nine life was very different than the nine to li- nine to five life that we all uh, got to experience both sides of. And so <laughs> that really stands out in the film about the business. My father used to say that it was built on a house of cards um, in that management wasn't professional management outside of himself. And I said, David, let me get to it in a little bit or tomorrow. Otherwise, I won't be able to pay attention to the amount of detail that you need in this. So from that moment forward, it was always, Scott doesn't pay attention to detail. Yeah, again, at the end of the day, you know, I worked there for almost 20 years, 21 years almost, um, you know, and caught it right at the end of the upswing. Um, you know, when the thing was at the top of the, the highest peak, it was unbelievable. It was impressive. Uh, uh, the reputations these people had was impressive. Their standing in their communities and in the marketplace and that includes worldwide, they really had uh, an impact. So so you see that, and that all comes out. And conversely, what you see, and, and in, in part one, I don't think we got to it yet, but you'll see in part two and part three, that after 50, 55 years, again, partially because of this inability to, um, to, to maintain this togetherness as, as the generations went on, the whole thing started to crumble. And and it's also at the time of, of an anti-fur movement that's rising up and has big impact. And it's also at a time when the social structure is changing and you know people are, aren't dressing up right. to go out to the grocery store anymore, which, right. which, of which you would need a fur color. And so mm-hmm. everything about the lifestyle and what was going on in America starting in the late 70s you know, didn't, didn't really uh, uh, bode well for the need for this product going forward. So, so that all comes out and you'll see that going forward. In fact, here, I've got a little bit of part two, and we'll show you a quick uh, trailer of that. Let me okay. Put that on. Julius and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident, and this setback rocked the family during a time when Brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. Those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or, you know, the relationship skills were really lacking and that got passed down. DNA really plays a role in, in any, you know, in anyone's well-being. All I know is that he had a photographic memory, he was brilliant, and the family loved him. So she was always, you know, like I was her little doll. She loved, but she was very interesting and fun and vivacious. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the Beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got got hurt because their coats weren't there. And, you know, it was it was just a bad thing. Not for nothing. We were supposed to be life. You know what I mean? We were following, you know, that suit. I'll never forget it. He threw this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table. And he says, this is what Evans is. And you know what happened to these dinosaurs? That wasn't what the legacy that he wanted for himself. He didn't want to wake up and smell the coffee. So he just... You know, he did the things that he enjoyed doing. Uh, 
let's talk about some of the things that didn't make it into the film. Tell us about <laughs> some of those stories. Well, you know, one of the things you learn as a first-time filmmaker, the hard way, is you can't do it all, right? So there are a lot of things in the film that I would want to, um, you know, have people know about. And some of it made it into the second and third parts. And some of it, again, just ends up on the cutting room floor because, you know, I have uh, 100 hours of, of interview tapes and you, there's only so much you can tell in uh you know in three documentaries which is what four four and a half hours so um you know one of the one of the things that didn't make it business wise had to, and i guess family wise had to do with the story between uh, my cousin david who was running the company and my grandfather who was the last of that older generation mm -hmm. from the film that hung around and david was ready for him to be out and wanted him squeezed out and my grandfather just so happened to have a long time assistant working for him that you know, kind of unfairly, they'd been promising the guy for the job for years, but my grandfather just wouldn't retire. And right. you know, I, I don't want to tell you the whole story here. I'll, I'll show it to you. <laughs> then we can talk about it in a sec. So Harold is running Boston. At the same time, his assistant, a guy by the name of Frank Ricky, who I actually trained under as a teenager, he was Harold's uh, loyal assistant for 30 years. 30 years. And they always promised him that when Harold retired, he would be the man. And the day seemed to never come. And at the same time, as I said, David Meltzer is looking to check out of the company, stop working so hard. He wanted to give up much of what he was doing except for one thing, his seven-figure salary. And uh, my grandfather was highly critical of that. And so David Meltzer makes this move to move Harold out, push him into retirement, give the Boston operation to Frank Riccio. And Harold was not ready for that. So there's, any, there's how that goes a little bit. So, any, other, um, any other tidbits you want to share? Uh, well, there's, there, there are so many. Um, you know, uh, Again, when you pull back all, all the layers of the lenses and put the onion, that piece is the onion layers back together, um, there, it's shocking to me. I knew some of the people in my family had issues with each other and maybe weren't speaking with each other still decades later. Mm -hmm. um, but again, now I know the stories of some of those that did not make it in the film. I don't even know if I'm prepared to share it here <laughs> today, but, you know, but there are some situations that explain those kinds of feuds. I mean, I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said about him, that he did say about his sister and the things that I saw him do to her and the blowback that came to me from Marnie and Jerry, which was beyond horrible. But what I learned personally from the film and doing this and you know and i said to most of them on the film especially as time went on and the, the latter ones that i interviewed and some of my family i even went back and um re-interviewed is that are you sure you don't want to let this go and you want to just keep that are we all going to die like this not you know certain people not speaking to each other and the antithesis of everything that those people that came before us would have wanted and would have preached and granted even with their shitty parenting ability right that yes. the one thing that that you could um you could say that they they had was this unity they were all for one and one for all mm -hmm. they were i'll tell you another tidbit that i don't think is in the film um even as they got wealthy they were also giving each other these luxurious birthday gifts i i used to joke that you know, there was like this fifteen thousand dollar check that just get kept getting passed <laughs> around from person to person throughout the year. And it's like, why are you people are all done very well now? Why are you just giving each other fifteen thousand? And it, there was a symbolism to it, obviously. Sure. So who they were, where they came from, the the continuation of the unity and everything. So 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 I understood that, mm -hmm. but it was also kind of funny in its own way. Yeah. So it it sounds to me, from the medical perspective, that you are somewhat of an unexpected and unanticipated, that's the same word, it sounds to me like you're the un unexpected therapist in some ways, in that you are bringing people together with this film 
whether it makes a change in behavior or not is not the point, but you're bringing out saying, you know, this is what's going on. This is what I see. Can we come together? That is huge. You wouldn't think that a film would develop this therapist. I'll tell you a couple, a couple of funny other things about on that, in that vein is um, more than one person in my family called me after their interviews, not right after, but after some time to reflect and told me that it's, it's getting them to consider looking at things differently. Whether that inspires any change or not, I don't know. Um, and then another thing that I found was funny was that as time started going on, I started becoming kind of a therapist in these interviews. Like, um, one of my cousins said something to me in an interview, and I challenged her, and I said, well, genetics loads the gun, and it's the environment that pulls the trigger, which is a quote right from Dr. Whitman in the film. And, you know, I almost wanted to crack up laughing in the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that, and obviously you've done some healing with this. Well, if I go if I go back to the start a little bit, the whole thing ended up completely different than what its intention was. At the beginning, this truly was going to be the story of this family business mm -hmm. and its rise and subsequent fall. Because I just felt, like I said, the story of that alone, the growth and then the toppling of it by you know the anti-fur movement and social changes and, mm -hmm. and all these things I explained that alone I thought was a pretty compelling story, but. As I interviewed more and more people and more and more of my relatives and more and more uh, former employees of the company, this thing really took on a life of its own. And I realized, uh, as I think you kind of see, as we've talked about my family a little bit here, that this was not the story about a business. It's a story about people. It's a story about their interactions. It's a story about <clears throat> the damage that was inflicted upon them by their parents mm -hmm. and how that affected everybody uh, uh, going up and down the line. It's just, it was a story about um, that in this business empire, the kind of shit that's going on in the family isn't going on in the, in the empire. So I don't know if that's a conscious or subconscious mm -hmm. decision being made to, you know, work and treat people this way over here and not over here. And, yeah. you know, again, that's part of that is clearly family dynamic stuff. <laughs> um, but, but so, yeah, so, so, so the whole thing became, uh, very different than what its intention was. And and the therapist thing actually came on later in the story when this thing happened, because I got to a point where I'm interviewing all these people and they're like, you know, I, th I think I said to my partner at one point, you know, God, these people need a therapist. And then it was like, swing, you know, I guess <laughs> like ding, ding, ding. So, you know, these two people that had this um, tremendous flavor to the thing trying to explain from a psychological standpoint what's going on as you watch these films. And, and so, yeah, um, the therapeutic and psychological and, and whatnot aspect of it was completely unintentional and became part of um, this film really taking on a life of its own. Question about genetics. Is there some genetic loading that predisposes uh, family members to um, depression and maybe some other mental disorders? And what you'll hear in medicine uh, pretty uniformly is that Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Operating under tremendous pressure, okay, to succeed. Um, and they're all responding to that pressure in a different way. This is a really complex piece, and the family dynamics are really complex. What were you hoping to achieve with this the thing that i wanted to want to come out of this most out of all of these films which you know i can't answer for you all of you will have to answer as you see it is do you, you know like i said do you see do you watch this and go i know that person i know her i have an uncle like that i have a friend like that i worked for a boss like that I, there's somebody i admire and respect like that and there's an asshole who i'll never forget like that <laughs> and i think that's what you see so you know, while parts of the story are unique, especially the uh, depth of the of the tragedies that are involved that you see as it goes on, which are, you know, much more than anything business related, right. um, there, there, there's that aspect of it that um, a, a everybody who watches it sees themselves or something about themselves or their lives because, you know, all families have their have their 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 BS. Right. But it, it's how it's what the response is to that and how. Uh, you know, and, and how we rise or don't rise to that occasion. And and what I love about my family story, which I, some of it I reflect on, 
you know, sadly, but what I love about being able to deliver to everybody the story is that you have these six unique players, pawns on the chessboard, who, because of the actions of the king and queen, all move in a different direction and, and end up either still on the chessboard and king and queen, of the, are, are, you know, queen themselves on the back end of the board or knocked out of the game. And, and that's the story. And again, everybody in every family has uh, pieces and parts of this story. And I think everybody will hopefully see that in, in, in this film and the other films subsequently to follow. And the other piece that I see watching this is that biggest, the bigger the family, the more money and more power that's around that, the more conflicts and, and it kind of drops out and becomes um, a failure in the long run. And you see that with a lot of family. Yeah, well, because, you know, again, you know, going back to things that may or may not make it into the <clears throat> subsequent versions of a film, uh, succession in a business is really important, right? Mm -hmm. And just assuming that because so and so is so and so's son or daughter or cousin or nephew or whatever, that they're the ones to do this job, you know, is, there's a little bit of hubris involved in going down that road. And there's no real business school that's that's preaching that. Just assuming that this family could, because this guy's a genius, that his son's a genius, and 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 his nephew's a genius, and it's great. And that includes me, you know. I mean, you know, I, you know. I wanted to be doing this way back when making films, not in that business. But you could, we all, all, all of us got the why would you pursue your dreams when we have the successful business? Right. Yeah. And that's a common thing that I've heard from other businesses. So, and yeah. And so that's the story. So, you know, skin on skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. I hope everybody gets a chance to see it and enjoy it. So, thank you for interviewing me. I was going to talk to you a little bit, but. It all worked out great. Huh? And, and I, thanks for having me part of this. I think it's a really worthwhile project, and I'm looking forward to seeing how far you can take it. Thank you so much, and thank you yourself for being a very integral part of the project. So everybody have a great day. I'm Scott Hunter. We'll see you for the next episode of the podcast for Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier.